Hi, welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about the future, the future of McMinnville. And the person to talk to about that is our planning director, Heather Richards. Heather, thanks so much for being here with yeah, us today. Thank you for having me. Well, you come from a, um, a long line of experience in this, uh, all over the state and um, even around the world. Let's go back to, you grew up where? So I grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts. It's on the other side of Massachusetts to Boston. Um, so it's very similar to Oregon in terms of east-west side. It's a farming community and also has five colleges. And you went to uh, Columbia. I went to Columbia University. That's in New York City. And then a graduate degree. Uh, at Eastern Michigan University, which is in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And your graduate degree was in what? Urban and regional planning. Okay, so you've been through the, the, the mill on getting educated on this, and you've had a long history here, as people are going to see. And I just want to say, I think we're lucky to have you here in McMinnville. So um, thank you. Well, for... thank you. I feel lucky to be here, so. All right. Well, um, after, after your um, undergraduate degree, you went to London. So not many people pick up and go to London. How did that happen? I just, uh, so I, I went to school in New York City. Many of my cohorts were going down to Wall Street and, uh, you know, getting good job offers. I had a similar one. But at some point in time, I just decided, you know what, this is the time for me to see the world. Um, so I put my name in for a lottery for a work visa in London, got it, and went. And what did you do there? So there I worked at an architectural firm. Um, they were working on a large redevelopment project in the Smithfield Markets area. It was just coming, uh, it was just changing from a meat warehouse area to a housing area. So it was actually a lot of fun. And it got me interested in redevelopment and planning. And from there you went to work for the Air Force. How did that happen? Uh, another sort of, I just decided I needed to continue to travel and I put my name in for a um, job where the Air Force was, um, closing down some Air Force bases over in Europe and they needed somebody to work on an assessment of cultural resources on those bases. So the cultural resources that were owned by the host nation. Um, and so I went in and, and made sure that we hadn't changed those cultural resources in any significant way when we turned it back to the host nation. And an example of that is in Germany, um, a lot of our Air Force bases were on military bases that Hitler occupied, and he did a lot of unique architectural elements to hide tanks, staging areas, and stuff like that. We then took those buildings and used them for housing for our military, and so I went in and made sure that we hadn't changed those buildings significantly before we turned it back over. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it was a very interesting job. And um, then it was time to come back to the U.S. You went to, that's where you went to graduate school. Uh-huh. And um, there, from there, you went to Baker City? Yeah, so I had, um, I was, uh, before I went into planning, I was interested in women's history. So I was doing a thesis on women on the Oregon Trail and decided one summer I needed to travel the Oregon Trail to understand more about it and landed in Baker City and just fell in love with the community. Um, and so when I got out of graduate school, I learned there was a job there and I was like, I need to go back. It was just, it was very random. It was a great match for me though. And you've been in Oregon ever since. I've been in, in, in the Northwest ever the since. Northwest. I did a stint in Idaho for a while, but yes. Oh, that's right. Okay. So what happened in Baker City that just kind of jumps into mind? What was fun? What was outstanding? Uh, so I was a young single person, and it was interesting to me. I, you know, my history has been mostly urban areas, and so I landed in this community of 10,000 people that's very ranch-oriented. My story is when I first got there, there was a cattle drive on Main Street <laughs> but I th and, and guys on horses, and I thought they were filming a movie. I called my mom. I'm like, they're filming movies here. No, this is real life. <laughs> yeah. in Vegas. This guy pulls up to me on his horse, has me roll down my window. I'm in my car. He's like, you don't know what you're doing. I said, no, I don't. He's like, just pull over. <laughs> we'll go around you. Uh, but anyways, Baker was a lot of fun. I was the Main Street manager there. So uh, historic Baker City is very similar to McMinnville Downtown Association. Uh, and I went in there and was the Main Street manager. It was a lot of fun for me. I met Patty Webb. She was the Main Street manager here at the time. And mm -hmm. we developed developed a relationship. She was a mentor for me. So that was my first connection to McMinnville. Okay. Well, that, okay. These connections, your interest in the Oregon Trail got you to Oregon. Your meeting Patty Webb mm -hmm. evidentially got you to McMinnville, but there were quite a few stops before that. Nampa, Idaho, you were instrumental in a lot of their, their planning there. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, Na so Nampa was on the cusp of a lot of changes when I was there. It was in the from 2000 to 2007, and I had the opportunity to lead a lot of large planning projects. Um, we worked on an economic development plan, an, a large urban renewal district. It's about a $125 million district. Um, we did a downtown revitalization plan and also built a lot of public improvement projects. Um, I was able to lead the effort for all the planning, strategizing, and visioning, and put the funding tools in place. And they're still building these projects today from that planning process. It's a lot of fun to see a community take this vision that you work so hard on and move forward with it and implement it. Was creating that uh, that vision, did you uh, reach out to the community? How did that work? Yeah, it was a large, so my process is always a community process. I, um, I'm i not the person with the ideas. I'm the person who sort of sets the table so people can come and share their ideas and we can put it all together in a final product. So it was a very large community visioning process. And I think that's the way plans are successful because someone like me can come and go in and out of a community, but if the communities put together the plan and they own it, they'll move it forward. Okay. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, Redmond, what happened there? What, what stands out? Uh, so Redmond, again, another community on sort of the cusp of some changes. And um, I was able to be there for about 10 years and worked with them on a downtown redevelopment plan and putting together an urban renewal district there as well. Um, and worked on a lot of public improvement projects. What was different in Redmond was I got involved in some parks projects too, which was a lot of fun. So I, I, I like the side of planning and also project development and, and having that mixture in my, uh, my professional life. And uh, for both project development and planning, I'm very community based. So I built two parks there. One park was uh, called Hope Playground, uh, very similar to the um, the inclusive park that's being built here uh, and it was a community build so it was all volunteer build volunteer design uh, and then volunteer donations to build it a lot of fun and very gratifying when that park was opened community was really behind it yes they were they were it yes yeah it, <laughs> it wouldn't was, have happened without theirs. the community yeah. and the design was you know ended up being so much more unique i mean one person can have one idea but if you get 100 people in a room and bring all those ideas together that design is so much more unique and interesting and compelling mm. wow so. sounds like a tourist stop check it out yeah <laughs> and then here yeah and then i you know gratefully i landed here so now, you came here and you um, followed a planning director that had been here for how long? Uh, if I remember correctly, close to 25 years. Yeah. So. And, and who was that? Doug Montgomery. Yeah. Yeah. So you had some big shoes to fill. Mm hmm And Martha Mika, Meeker hired you mm -hmm. and gave you a task, um, one of your first tasks, which was to do a review. Yeah. What was the results of that? So Martha asked me to take the first three months and really do an assessment of the planning program. Um, and uh, so I worked with the team, the planning team, as well as the planning commission. And we went through and did an assessment of what, where we were at with plans, foundational plans, um, where we were at in terms of compliance with state and federal regulations, and where some of our foundational documents like the zoning ordinance and things of that nature, and then where there were potential needs moving forward into the future for McMinnville. What it, what it, uh, the end result was that McMinnville is a wonderful community with a great team of people here, but there has been um, a disinvestment of sorts in long-range planning. I, th I feel comfortable saying that, and there are a lot of long-range plan planning needs that haven't been attended to, um, that we're out of date on, that we're out of compliance with the state and the federal government on. Um, and I know that Doug was aware of that. It, it was happening at the same time we were in a recession, so there just weren't resources to pay for these updates and plans. Um, but they are things that we should probably be looking at and trying to move forward. So these were budget decisions, driven mm -hmm. decisions. These weren't people um, thinking it was a bad idea or not knowing. It was, hey, we're in a tough spot here and uh, we can't do everything. Right, exactly. I, I believe so. I mean, I obviously wasn't here. I've looked through Doug's memos. He was aware of, of, of the needs as well. It was clear to me uh, about that. And, and, you know, the city has a lot of needs in terms of how we serve the community as an organization. And the resources are, you know, not are 
uh, it finite, so we have to decide how we're going to expend those resources and where the priorities were are. And it was a recession, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you talked about a number of things that needed attention. Now, you've picked out probably a few that you feel like this is the time we have to move on these. You've gotten budget approval. What are some of those highlights on those choices? Yeah, so um, I, not necessarily budget approval. One of the things I realize fairly quickly coming into McMinnville is that the re that I'll have to be more creative about how I get things done than I have in the past because the resources are, are limited here uh, for planning purposes. So we've been applying for grants and working with colleges and partnering with universities and academia to see how we can set these up. But um, to me, some of the primary things that I think McMinnville that we should be looking at in the next couple of years is really trying to understand where we're at in terms of growth. Um, and opportunities for growth and how we manage that growth. And so a big piece of that is understanding how much build, buildable land we have left within our city limits and our urban growth boundary. Uh, in my world, there's a, what we call a buildable lands inventory. We need to always, by law, have five years worth of buildable land within the city limits and 20 years within the urban growth boundary. And we should be updating our buildable lands inventory every three to four years. We haven't updated the buildable lands inventory for McMinnville since 2001. And where that's impactful is, um, you know, housing prices right now are, are significant. They're high. Land prices are high. Land supply is low. Um, so there isn't a lot of land for a developer to come in and buy a parcel and build new housing that isn't already owned by another, another developer that's moving forward with subdivision plans. Uh, affordable housing has become an issue and we can't find land for those projects either. So um, we haven't done the analysis, so I can't say confidently one way or other that that's the barrier, but I would I would feel pretty confident saying it's at least contributing to the affordable housing problem here in McMinnville, the land supply. And not knowing what we have in terms of growth opportunities it means that we can't manage it. Growth is going to happen. So I know there's a lot of people who are like, can't we just shut down the borders and not build anything more? But um, we can't. That's not the Oregon land use. It's all about having growth happen in the city so that we can protect our ag lands and forest lands in the county. So growth is going to happen and if we don't plan for it, it happens to us rather than us planning for it and managing it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we were talking about buildable um, land for housing. We, you brought some slides with you about uh, about that the housing starts uh, over the past uh, couple of decades. Maybe we could bring those up, Carolyn. Um, the trends there, the top one is single, single family dwelling units. Those are starts, right? Yes. The new, yep. new units. Mm -hmm. And they're in the, the, the peak of it was, uh, the peak of it was, you know, anywhere between 2002 to 2007, we were averaging almost 200 units per year. Uh, that those charts show a time period of 2000 to 2016. So I wanted to take a snapshot of years prior to recession and years after the recession. Um, after the recession, so in the recession we were dipping down below 50 units per year, and then after the recession we've hovered around 80 units per year. Um, that's to me that's a little bit concerning because for a community the size of about 34,000 people we should be issuing more permits than 80 units per year now post recession mm -hmm. many of our comparable cities are so it's contributing to the supply issue that's happening here okay let's let's go to the next slide Carolyn thank you so this is it is either labeled industrial commercial and other non residential yeah so this this is also showing other types of permitting levels in the community um, and again it's it hasn't recovered post recession which is concerning to me um, not sure if this is land supply specific or not um, but it is something that we should be aware of as a community because not only is this bringing new industry in for jobs which is important for us it's also tax base which helps pay for services so you know as a city uh, if we look at it as a business we have a cost of goods so the tax revenues goes to pay for it cost of goods, that's providing services, public safety, administration, planning, parks, whatever it is. If, if we don't have a tax base that's going up at the same level of the cost of goods, then we're reducing our service levels. Okay. All right. That's those two slides. Now, as a result of your review, 
you picked out some things that you wanted to work on and focus on, and you made a timeline. Um, was that was that the result? The reason for the review was to make a plan. Yes. And yes. Th and that plan, I think we have in the next two slides. Yes. So let's bring those up. So we have work product, long range plans. There's a lot there. We can't go through each one. Heather, why don't you pick out some of the highlights that you see there? And in, in, in the first, the second column was 2017, 2019, and 2019 and 2021, and then 2021 to 2023. So that's quite yeah. a look into the future. So this is our five year snapshot. And in planning, we look at long range plans. So that's the plans that sort of guide future growth. Uh, we look at the comprehensive plan because that's the overall community vision. And then the zoning ordinance is what is guiding development in terms of how it's built. Um, so, you know, we ha we do have a lot of very, it, we have a lot of out of date products in all three of those elements. We also have limited resources. So we put together our five year snapshot based on what we felt we could get done mm -hmm. in the first two years with either grants or in house personnel. Um, and then start building a foundation towards doing some of the bigger lifts in the next three years after that. So for example, one of the um, first grants we went for was a grant to look at Three Mile Lane, which is out there by Highway 18. We felt it was important to study that because we haven't put a plan in place for that area since 1992. And if the development that's occurred over, out there is different than what that original plan was in 1992. So, you know, Dell Smith's investment that that's happened out there, as well as uh, most recently the Jackson family investment that's occurring so there. It's happening to us. We yeah, a plan. exactly. <laughs> and so th that's where you know, to me, we want we want to manage the growth and what's happening. You only get one opportunity at this. Once improvements are built, they're usually in place for at least 50 years. So you want to make sure they're done the right way and the way the community wants them done. And so to be able to get in front of that um, is important. And out at Three Mile Lane, there's still a lot of acreage that's in the city limits that's not developed. Um, and so as that investment interest is taking place out there, we want to make sure that the new development that's occurring is exactly what we need for this community moving forward. So we got a grant for that. We'll start that process in July. Um, it will be a community dialogue about what we want to see out there, in, both in terms of the product that hits the ground and how it looks. We're also going to look at um, how to connect that area to the city center because it feels very disconnected for a lot of people. Um, in fact, a lot of people don't even think of that as part of McMinnville. So how, how can we create pathway projects from that area to the city center? And we have a great park down there in Joe Dancer Park. We could easily set up a path that goes down to Joe Dancer and up to the downtown area that people can bike and walk on. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's those opportunities too that we'll be looking at. At the same time, we're reconstructing the bridge that goes over to Three Mile Lane. Yes. Uh, that construction will probably take place in 2021, so it is funded now. And so if we put in a, a planning process in place in terms of how we utilize that bridge and connect to it too, uh, to make sure that that's serving Three Mile Lane in the city center as well, we'll be in front of that. So a good timing for that. And we did get the grant, it's about $170,000. Okay, and so that's, that's um, let's go back, Carolyn. <clears throat> That's the um, two year, and then out of yeah. 19 uh, through 21, what's, what's a high point there? So, well, I wanted to, so Three Mile Lane is looking at opportunity, and that's a special interest plan. Then we also have in that two, the, the, these two years we're in right now, we apply for a grant for a buildable lands inventory. I talked about the importance for that and a housing needs analysis. There's a lot of discussion about affordable housing need here in McMinnville. Mm -hmm. I personally think the housing need is, uh, runs the spectrum of all housing products. We mm -hmm. also have executive housing needs here, as well as um, mm -hmm. market rate apartment housing. We're hearing from our businesses that they're struggling to recruit new employees because employees can't find places to live. And it runs the gamut from executives at the hospital to young millennials at TTR software. So we want to make sure that that we're serving all those needs. Uh, so we'll do a housing needs analysis and then we'll take it the next step. And uh, not all communities do this, but this is where I feel there's a lot of value and we need to inv invest our time there, which is doing a housing strategy. So you know the data, you've done the analysis. Okay, so now how do we move it forward in a way that we want it to move forward as a community? Uh, and that will be a housing strategy. 
So then that's going to build into 2019, 2021, where we'll start taking some of that information and diving it a little bit deeper. So we'll go, we'll start looking at a city center housing strategy. Um, typically, there's a lot of discussion about the need for apartments and, and density. That's usually in your city center because that's where the services are. But, you know, downtown McMinnville is a very unique and very special place. So being able to bring that type of housing into downtown will be, we'll have to be very surgical about how we approach that so that it's an asset and doesn't depreciate from the asset that we have currently. And so doing a city center housing strategy uh, to look at where's the best places for that and what should it look like and how do we be respectful of the historic built environment that already exists and build upon that will be really important to us. And then I see out in 2021, 20, 23, to start the conversation about the urban growth boundary amendment. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just let that lay for now. We'll talk about that. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy to start right now because I think we should. Okay. But um, but I I think McMinnville needs to understand a little bit more data. Since I've been mm -hmm. here, um, I would say in my conversations with people, probably 50% of the communities in this no growth position. We don't want to grow anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, another 50% of the community is we're growing. We need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so we're not on the same page as to what. The future looks like or um, how comfortable we are with starting the discussion for that i think we need to start the discussion so we understand it the reality is we're expected to grow by ten thousand people uh, in the next 10 to 12 years um, and then we are also expected in the next 50 years to absorb 34 percent of the population growth in yam hill county which will bring us up to about 50,000 people so 50 to 60,000 people so we need to figure that out and what's that going to look like? And in such a way that we protect the charm that exists here in McMinnville. Okay, Carolyn. You know, we're going to have to just go to the next slide, be even though there's probably um, a few more hours there to discuss on that one. <laughs> Um, what's down, oh, accomplishments 2017? Yeah, so what this shows is the first two years, and we're reporting, to plan, we're reporting to city council next week on this, but the first year, the accomplishments was really looking at a lot of development code issues that we had and how to go in there and tweak those so that we could make sure immediate development was doing what we wanted it to do. We also focused on training and started to set the table for the long-range planning that we want to do in 2018, which is some of those projects I talked about and applying for grants for those. Next year's work plan is pretty intense. Um, this is a work plan that, that's done with my team of two planners and the planning commission. So it's a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, it's ambitious. I recognize that, but uh, we need to start somewhere. So. Okay. And I see with grant next to each one, those are grants that have already been received. Uh, most of them have been received. There's the one for the buildable lands inventory we've applied for, we've heard we're competitive and we should hear by the end of this month. Well, good luck. And it's, it's always troubling to say, uh, you know, good luck on getting a grant so that we can do our buildable housing inventory. <laughs> Something's wrong with how we fund our future, <laughs> but, uh, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, the state does give out grants for those, that type of work and they're, uh -huh. they're aware of McMinnville's needs. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I'm sure you're doing a masterful job um, and you've won quite a few grants already. Well, let's get into the next section. We're going to have to fly through these. Um, okay. Um, what do we have here? Hey. So this is my approach to planning. I just, it, uh, it's all about building a puzzle and how all these different pieces fit together. I don't think people realize just how much goes into planning. There's the above ground, you know, stuff that most people are aware of in terms of housing, schools, uh, you know, industrial development. But we're also looking at how sewer, how are we connecting everything to the wastewater system, um, parks, uh, making sure that everybody has access to a park, trails so that people can connect to those parts. Public art is actually part of planning as well because it, it attributes to quality of life. We're looking at trees and how those are contributing to the overall uh, community. So we look at a lot of things uh, it's, it's so that we can build this puzzle, what the future community will, will look like. And I see down there in the corner, freight, um, you know, no trucks on this road kind of thing to give quality of life to those folks. But hey, the trucks have to get yeah. there. Yeah, so how are they going to get there? Yeah. And so freight routes are important for that. Uh, lights as well. But you'll notice this is white, and it's white for a reason, because we know all the elements that need to be put together to build the puzzle, and then we work with the community on what they want that image to be. So what do we want future McMinnville to look like? And that's where we need to sort of create that image that, um, that all those pieces build into. 
So this is, and and I truly think it is community. It's all of us working together. So I like to use this image to show that. A lot of people are always asking me, so what do you want to do? And what do you think, uh, where we should grow? And What's your this. plan? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not my plan. It's mm -hmm. the community's plan. My job is to help people to set, to set the room up so that people feel comfortable having the discussion and putting the plan together and then implementing the plan. That, that's, that's my role. People do come to the table with different agendas. So another role is facilitating that. We all have things we're passionate about, which is good, um, but we have to recognize that we are one piece of that larger puzzle and that our puzzle pieces need to fit together. So that's another role that we have as planners is, is ensuring that every voice is heard um, and also respected. So some of the things, uh, 2032 is our 150th birthday. I, I, I'm all about birthdays. We did a 100th birthday in Redmond. It was a lot of fun. It, it's right around the corner. And so it's an opportunity for us as, as the current generation of McMinnville residents to talk about what's our legacy that we're going to leave for the next generations and, and to build towards that for that 150th sesquicentennial birthday. So I like to put the flag in the sand about 2032 and uh, planning for that. So right now we're working with McMinnville Economic Development Partnership about creating jobs and not just any job, we're really trying to look at family wage jobs. So 1,500 family wage jobs in the next 15 years for the 150th birthday. That's our goal. Um, and we want to do it in such a way that people can afford to live here. Mm -hmm. So Terrific. This is a great example of what that looks like. TTR is a company here in McMinnville that uh, maybe a lot of people aren't aware of. It started as two employees. It grew to 70 employees over five years. It's uh, They do tax software development. and. Um, and so they're hiring people who are accountants, lawyers, businesses, and uh, analysts. It's a great company. They had an opportunity and were recruited by many other um, communities in the state. Uh, but they pulled their employees, and, and over 50% of their employees said they wanted to stay in McMinnville. And so they made that commitment to stay here. They just recently bought a um, property and uh, rehabbed it for their future corporate headquarters. They expect to grow to 200 employees here very shortly. So that's the future of McMinnville right there. Those those are the jobs that, you know, the family wage jobs that we're really trying to recruit into this community. And they're committed. They're giving back to the community as well. So we took those two elements of the family wage jobs and what's occurring here and started talking about, well, what can we do um, to recruit more of those? Because, you know, what's so nice about McMinnville is it's a beautiful place to live. It's a great community. So people who are able to, you know, com people who can locate and do their jobs anywhere, and that's that's our new job force. Um, we think they should be coming here. So we created this Tech Draw program, uh, and it's all about growing tech in Oregon's wine country and looking at those software developers and and saying to them, hey. You know, you can do that work here in McMinnville and have a great quality of life and communicate back to the community. So, and the last piece is uh, parks. Uh, we're going to start looking at parks and public gathering spaces. Our, um, we have the opportunity to look at how our open space serves the community. I had a mentor say to me early in my career that the best spaces best spaces should be owned by the public in a community because everyone best should have a. Should be owned by the public. Yeah. Yeah, because everybody should have an opportunity to use those spaces, right? Um, and so I think that's really important, and we'll start looking at that as well. Well, Heather, you have a favorite word, not a favorite word, but one I've heard you use a lot, and that's connectivity. Maybe you'd like to uh, talk a little bit about, just in the next uh, few seconds, your vision for connectivity. So I use connectivity in a couple of ways. Um, connectivity in terms of how the community is connecting to our future. Um, connectivity in terms of how people are connecting to their built environment. And then connectivity in terms of how we get around. And so I think McMinnville is really poised to do um, a pretty comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian network here. Um, and to, in terms of tr uh, getting people out of their cars and out and meeting with each other and socializing with each other and also connecting them to places, getting them around. So we're working with uh, Portland State University to bring in a team of students from there to work with us on a bicycle pedestrian plan. All right. Well, that's amazing. We are lucky to have you. Thank you for bringing this to us, and uh, we'll check back in with you in a while. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you, Heather.